All right, so now we're recording the meeting. Uh, so anyway, good evening. This is Dave, WO2X. And what I want to go do, uh, tonight is to go through, and I have a little bit of a list, and basically go through these, the basics of Node-RED. And oh, I didn't probably save. Uh, but anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, I've already partially installed um, the nodes. So the first thing, first thing is uh, installing the node red on the Pi. And uh, if you're going to use FR stack, you can uh, follow the procedure in the wiki to install FR stack also. Um, and that'll get you to the point where we're ready to install the extra nodes. And then once you do that, you'll be ready to start importing flows and then customizing the dashboard. So the wiki is pretty straightforward with the Raspberry Pi on installing Node-RED. And what I've done is I've built up a Raspberry Pi for the, uh, for the call tonight, where I'm at that point. I'm at the point where I'm ready to start installing nodes. Uh, rather than going through the full list of nodes, uh, what I've done is I've gone ahead and, uh, and pre-installed some of the nodes. So uh, I'm going to go to our group site, Node Red for Ham Radio. And again, in the wiki section, uh, after you get done installing uh, Node Red and installing FR Stack, uh, there's a readme here with a list of nodes that I recommend that you go ahead and uh, install. And what I'm going to do is I'll bring this over to the other screen temporarily. And to access, once you get everything up and running, uh, you need to know the IP address of your Raspberry Pi. And in my case, uh, it's 10.0.0.71. And then it's colon 1880. And that will get you to the editor. So right now I have no flows installed and it's pretty basic. I've pre-installed some of the nodes so it doesn't take as long tonight. But in order to go through this again, uh, in this readme, it gives you instructions on how to install the extra nodes. So um, I'll move that again back over out of the way. And what you do is up in the upper right, uh, the first thing we want to do before we do this uh, is in node red, it defaults to the debug node, which we're going to be using to show some of the output. And as you're creating flows or modifying flows, the debug node is what you're going to be using to watch the data in between each node as it gets passed from one node to the other. And as we go through this, I'll explain uh, what, a, you know, what the nodes are and how the data goes from one node to the next. And we'll show some examples of this. But the debug node, which is up here, is uh, again, uh, a node that you're gonna be using quite often as you uh, debug uh, your, uh, the node that you're, the, the flow that you're creating uh, for whatever, whatever you're creating. And normally as a default, when you go into debug, uh, the output that would be in the right-hand window defaults to 1000 characters. Some of the messages, especially if you do a, on the Flex uh, API, the meter list will return a message longer than 1,000 characters. So what I do is I set mine to default to 5,000 characters instead of 1,000. To do that, um, in the wiki, it tells you to install VNC Viewer, which I've done. And I can connect into my Raspberry Pi and log into it. And now um, Node Red is installed under the Pi directory. And in order to view it, you have to go to View Show Hidden Files. And it's dot Node Red. In Linux, anything with a dot in front is a hidden uh, folder. So if we open up that folder, uh, you'll see there's a settings.js. And if we double click it, it'll bring up the editor. And in the editor, if I bring it up, uh, I can hit search, find, where is it here? It's debug max length. 
And so we want to go to the next. And now here it is. Debug max length is 1,000 characters as a default. So I'm just going to hit five and then hit the back, hit the delete key to remove the one, make it 5,000. And then I'm going to come back up. I'm going to close the editor. And I'm going to save. All right. I'm going to close. And in the terminal window, what I can do is I could do a sudo reboot to restart the Pi could have just stopped and restarted node red also, but uh, this will reboot the Pi. And I'm going to close the uh, BNC viewer at this point. So give that a uh, about 30 seconds or so to reboot. And if I hit refresh on, on my uh, web browser here right now, it's not connected. This is a Pi Raspberry Pi 4 that I'm running with four gig of RAM. So it runs pretty quick. So we're back up and our debug will give us 5,000 character output. So once we're at that point, and I'm going to add that to the wiki, by the way, to change that to 5,000 characters. So I'll edit the wiki and put that in. So the next thing we wanted to do is add these extra nodes uh, that are in that readme file. In order to do that, in the upper right, next to where it says deploy, there's a three horizontal lines. We call that the hamburger menu. You click on that and go to manage palette. These are the nodes that I've already installed. Uh, so going down the, going down the list, um, the first one in the readme that I do not have installed is, UI, is node red contrib UI level. So you click the install tab and I could search for UI dash level. And here it is. And I just click install and then click install to confirm. All right. The next one that I did not install is dashboard. That's very important. If without the dashboard, you will not have anything show up on the dashboard. So and that's node red dashboard. And that is installed. I thought I, did, I, thought I had removed it. Uh, the next one is the string node, node red contrib string. So if I go contrib string, you could put down partial names if you don't know what the full name is. And node red contrib string, and install that. That's used in quite a few node, uh, quite a few of the flows. The other one next that I uh, did not install was simple gate, simple dash gate. Node red contrib simple gate. And I'm just going to look at the ping node. I think I installed that node red node ping. Now well, we got to put that one in. And then the last one is uh, Stephen N1SH has been working on the new uh, flex radio nodes. So we just type in flex radio lowercase and node red contrib flex radio. He's up to version 077. And we're going to install that. All right, so now we have all of the nodes installed that were on the list. I had pre-installed some of them that are on that list. Uh, as more flows are created, or if there's any flows uh, that are already created that have special nodes that are not listed, uh, we're gonna edit this list and you know, you know, put them on the list. Any questions on adding uh, the nodes that you need? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and we're just going to do it from uh, SSH and uh, go ahead and we're just going to go ahead and do a node red, node dash red dash stop, dash stop, node dash red dash stop, stops node red. Hey, Steve. And then node dash red dash start. And this will restart node red.
So right now we have nothing installed, so we have no no information coming up at this point. So uh, I tell you what, I'll just minimize this for now. So now we're ready. We've got uh, Node-RED installed. Uh, we have it uh, went through the wiki, uh, did all the settings that are recommended in the wiki. And we've installed the nodes in the readme file in the wiki uh, the, that are recommended for the different flows. So uh, the first uh, flow that we'll install is uh, Stephen's uh, uh, or my, my uh, Flex Radio flow for Stephen's nodes. In order to import any of the flows that are on the site, uh, again, up in the upper right, that three horizontal line, the hamburger menu, we'll click on that, click import. And we're going to click select file to import. And what I've done is um, I have them all set up here for the ones that we're going to import tonight. So flexradio.json is my first one. That's the flow that I've been working on with Steven's new nodes. And I'm going to hit import. And it imported one flow, 103 nodes, 103 configuration nodes. And this is kind of what it looks like. And what I'm going to do is hit deploy. Now we've already set up the dashboard. Uh, we imported the dashboard uh, node. So in order to access the dashboard in Node Red, I'm going to open up another web browser. And again, it's the IP address of your Node Red server, whether it's a Pi or a PC, uh, 1880 UI for a user interface. And here is uh, the Node Red uh, Flex Radio flow that I've been working on. And right now, uh, you can see that my radio is powered up. It's connected up, it says Flex Radio 6600M and radio call sign. And if I go ahead and start Smart SDR, minimize that you'll see that it populates everything and in five seconds should start the meters. It'll probably make a liar out of me. I've been working on the meters. Um, so the meters may not be working 100% correct right now. Uh, I've been working on the meters uh, with Steven's new nodes. I haven't edited uh, my node red flow uh, for Flex Radio yet. So that's why the meters are not showing up. I have to go back and finish that tomorrow. So I will be uploading that and notifying the group once it is uh, uploaded and corrected. But when it does, you would see the input voltage, the PA voltage, the fan speed, the PA temperature. I have a, uh, a mic in peak meter and a mic peak indicator. So uh, for microphones connected directly to the radio, uh, that mic in and the mic peak indicator will work. So. This way, it takes the guesswork out of setting your audio levels for the mic connected directly to the radio. I uh, have not looked into the meters to see which one internal in the radio is a useful meter for setting it when you're running a remote client, such as a maestro, a laptop, or an iPad. Uh, but once you connect the client, you can see the client name is my desktop, client IP. Son of a bitch. What's up? Son of a bitch what? Oh, I'm sorry. I I thought I was muted, Dave. I, I'm I'm trying to start with a clean palette so I can stay with you, and I've got too much stuff on my okay. palette already. All my right. apologies. Yeah, no problem. I I am recording this, so you'll be able to go back and watch it and pause it and go through it at your leisure. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna mute myself now. No problem. Apologize for the uh, the language. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. Um, so what I've designed in, in my flow was when a client connects, it shows the client name, the IP, uh, the transmit VFO, whichever slice is active for transmit, uh, the mode that's active on the active transmit slice, my RF power setting, the tune power, and then ready or transmit. So if I were to turn around and take this and move this over to the other screen, uh, if I were to hit the MOX button, it goes ready to transmitting. So, and the, the little microphone and the speaker, uh, I did this just for me. 
uh, at, you know, the group that I'm in, we like to record each other and then play back the audio. So this is a quick record, that little dot that they, the red dot that they have in smart SDR is sometimes hard to click when you want to record somebody. So you can click this, it starts recording. You click it again, it stops, and then you can hit the play and it'll play it back. So again, and then I have just these meters that I've been using on my flows. Um, there are, go ahead, somebody have a question? Yeah, it's Barry, case exit A, how are you doing? Hey, go ahead, Barry. Um, on the iteration that you uh, helped me with the other day, mm -hmm. um, the PA voltage and temperature uh, meters do work. So I don't know if this flow is different. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, that was with Steven's older nodes. So you didn't upgrade yet to the 077 nodes. So uh, we'll have to go back in and, uh, you know, just delete that flex radio flow and you'll be importing a new flex radio flow once, uh, once I get it updated. I'll be doing that tomorrow. My wife's working tomorrow. So it's a radio play day for me. Okay, but mine do work. So right, right, right. Uh, they do work because you're using the older nodes. I've just updated to the latest nodes, and it, and it and it did break it on my end. Just the, the way I've been parsing the uh, the meter data, I have to adjust it for uh, using the um, using the proper uh, wild cards uh, to uh, parse the data. Okay, thanks. All right. So. Again, uh, we've, re we've imported the first flow, and what I'm going to do here is import uh, the remaining flows here, and then we'll go through. Once you import the first flow, it's important that the, it's going to have uh, several of these blue nodes. These are Stephen's uh, flex radio nodes. There's a request node, a message node, a meter node, and eventually this will get replaced with a uh, discovery node. And uh, the first time you do this, it'll probably have the wrong IP address set up. It'll have set up for my IP of my radio. So to set this up, you just double click one of the nodes and it'll show, in this case, my IP. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the pencil and I'm gonna hit delete. So when you first get it, when I, up the, when I upload it, it's gonna be showing the red triangle because there'll be nothing set up the blue dot won't be there but you'll have a red, red triangle to show you an error because uh, it's not configured so when i upload the flow i'm going to upload it without the ip address in there so you'll be required to double click one of these nodes it says add new flex radio you'll need to know the ip address of your radio you'll click on the pencil and under localhost you're going to put in the ip address of your radio and you're going to hit add and you're going to click done and then on the next nodes on the remaining ones instead of doing the pencil you just hit the pull down and select the radio and hit done and then you hit deploy and then you'll see that you have a green uh, with the ip address and the port number and showing that it's now connected to the radio so it's, again, when you, when you import the flex radio flow, I'll have it set up that there's no radio in the list. You'll need to just double click it, click the pencil, and you'll just add, you'll add a new radio. It'll, it'll say add new flex radio here. You'll click the pencil, put in under localhost. You'll just delete that and put in the IP of your radio. Cancel, cancel. So we're gonna import, uh, select a file, and these are all the flows that I use. So the next one I do is my amplifier to Power Genius. So I'm gonna hit open and then import, import a copy. And under the Power Genius, uh, what I would need to do is you need to double click this and put in the IP address of your Power Genius amplifier. And what I would suggest, rather than using static IPs for your radio equipment on the network is in your router. Look for that device in your router and do what they call a DHCP reservation in the router. And um, you can Google that DHCP reservation and there's plenty of information on how to do that. You can even Google DHCP, DHCP reservation 
Netgear Nighthawk R7000 or whatever the model of your router is, and you can find specific information on how to do a reservation. That's what I do. And the reason I do that is, is, is if something happened to my router tomorrow and I put a different router in place and all of a sudden it has a different IP address scheme, I wouldn't be able to talk to any of the equipment. So I just uh, do DHCP reservations for the equipment. So you set that to the IP address of the amplifier. Click hey, the Dave? Call. Yes. A quick question. Yes. Instead of using the IP addresses, can we use host names? Because part of the DHCP reservation would be the host name as well. That way, if it does change, uh, we don't have to worry about going in here and changing these flows. We could use you like could. the host name radio. You could, but some of the flex radio equipment just says flex radio or it says something else. Uh, I like the, the, the um, antenna genius doesn't say 403A. It, I forget the name that it comes up as, but some of the host names are not. Uh, you know, antenna genius two by eight or something. They, they, there's different names. And matter of fact, when you have a, an antenna genius stack where you have uh, the ability to have up to third, you know, two two radio, you know, two inputs and 32 antennas, which is four two by eight antenna switches, uh, you would need to have four separate IP addresses, but they could all potentially have the same host name. So, I mean, if you know the host name and it's unique, uh, yes, you should be able to do that. Okay. Uh, but the important thing here is that it would be, uh, the port is 9008 for the amplifier. And that, okay. that, that doesn't change. Appreciate it, thank you. So once you deploy that, you go back to the dashboard and there's my amplifier now. So I can come back in here and change the fan speed of the amplifier. Uh, it shows me my VAC is at 242 volts. Uh, right now, there's, uh, you know, I haven't transmitted, so there's no uh, VDD or ID. It, it remains uh, idle until you're ready to transmit. But I can sit there and toggle it to go between idle and standby. And you see when I go from standby, and when I turn it on, it says power up and then idle. And when it first comes on, it, it'll come back into operation and 52 volts VDD on sideband and two and a half amps. And it'll go up to about four amps uh, current during transmit. Uh, they bias it at two amps and receive and four amps on transmit. And if you notice, I have these other categories because I haven't imported them yet. The, the tuner genius, the host ping, pings the beam and the rotor. So uh, those flows we're gonna import now. So the next one, uh, after that is the tuner genius. And again, same thing with any of these flows that you can import, you just go to the hamburger men menu import and uh, you select it. You can either paste in the JSON code or you can browse to the file and uh, then you hit deploy. Uh, before you hit deploy, obviously you would come into here and same as the amplifier change the server to the IP address or the host name of the tuner genius. And again, now we have, uh, yeah, everything's kind of screwed up with the dashboard right now, as you notice. So we're gonna cover how to organize the dashboard after this. So right now everything just looks like crap, but the tuner genius is there. And I can, again, go between standby and operate, select radio one or radio two on the, uh, on the tuner genius. So continuing on, we'll import the rest of these. And the next one is the, um, the antenna genius. This one's an interesting one. Um, what I've done with the antenna genius right now is I only use three antennas. So if you notice, these are the buttons uh, in the middle column, the, uh, the green color R1, antenna one, antenna, it should be uh, uh, R2, antenna one, R1, antenna two, R2, antenna two. So I'm just using ports one, three, and four. So the other ones, they're, they're light color. If you double click it in the bottom left, you'll see it says disabled. I've disabled the buttons so that they don't show up on my dashboard. So you can enable that by just going in and hitting enable, hit done, and then it would be enabled. So we're gonna disable that since I'm only using three antennas. But this is set up for eight right now. 
The flow itself is set up for 16, which is two, two by eight switches stacked. And uh, you can actually double this up and take this and, and replicate it and have it two by 32. And what you would do is 403A cells, uh, AB switches. And if you wanted to do two by 16 on the A input to both of the uh, antenna switches, you would have the A side of the AB switch go to the master uh, two by eight antenna switch and the B side go to the slave side. And the same thing with the B input. So, and what you would do is you can modify this flow so that when you're selecting antennas one through eight, uh, uh, it would uh, send a relay command to uh, one through eight on the A side, would send the relay command to the first relay to set it in the A position. And then the same thing on the second one. And or if it's, if it's nine through 16, it would send a command to turn that relay on and switch it to the B position. Uh, I did not add the relay, those AB relays into this flow. Uh, if somebody has a specific need, I can help them build it, but most people are not running more than eight antennas. But it is there to do that. And in here, uh, the big thing is over here is the TCP, setting this to the IP address of the antenna switch. And in order to get to that, um, if you bring up the Antenna Genius app, it'll show you the antenna, the, the IP address right here in the beginning. So you got to use the Antenna Genius app on the, on the PC first to set up the switch. Once it's set up, then you can go ahead and just get that IP address, set it in the TCP node. And what I've also done here is it listens to UDP broadcasts from NN, N1MM Plus, and I've used port 12063 on the output of N1MM. So you can use the keyboard commands to switch between antennas that are active on that band. And it will toggle through. If I had, for example, on 20 meters, uh, antenna one and antenna four are active, but antenna three is not active on 20 meters. Uh, one's a Yagi and the other one's a G5RV. I could use the keyboard command in N1MM plus uh, and not have to take my focus off of N1MM when I'm contesting to be able to toggle between the two different antennas. So next one we're gonna import is going to be the rotor flow. So I have an RT21 controller and that's connected directly to my uh, Raspberry Pi. So I'm gonna import this. And uh, this one's interesting because these serial nodes, there's a serial in and there's a serial in node down here in the bottom left and up in the upper right, there's a serial out node. And in order for this to work, uh, I have a USB cable that goes from the controller to the Raspberry Pi and you've got to set this address. If I double click the serial out node and hit the pencil icon, you can see this is the path it says, or by ID, this is the path to that serial device, this whole string. And where you find that information, is, again, is in VNC. If we connect into the Pi, and I know one of the guys on the call had a question about this. And under dev, and then scroll down, I don't have it connected right now, so I do not see a folder called serial. But when I turn on my RT21 controller, you see a folder there with serial. If I open that up, and if you have more than one RT21, I would do this one at a time. And what I do is I do serial, I click on by ID, and there's the connection. So what I could do is right click this and go to copy path. And then we're done with this. And over here, I would just paste that in and that is the path to my rotor now. And it's 4,800 baud. And important down here, this should be 500 milliseconds for the default response timeout. Uh, typically, in my flow that I'm uploading, I already have this set. But when you create a serial node, it defaults to 10 seconds, a thousand, uh, 10,000 milliseconds. And 10 seconds is way too long. So, um, 
unless you're using something that has a character on the on the input or on the output. But I change it to 500 milliseconds, and then I hit update, done, and then over here on this one, I would just select that. You would have it would say add new serial port. You just use the pull down, same as when we did the flex radio nodes, and just select that and then hit done. And hey, so now Dave, we've, yeah. Just before you go on, I know there was a person this afternoon, I think he was on a, a PC. Right. So for him, if you could reopen the, uh, the serial node, and you won't, you'll do it a little bit different. You would hit that pencil, hit the pencil. Right. In your COM port, you can insert the spyglass. And right. it will find your port number. You know, it'd be COM, whatever yeah. the COM number is. Yeah, COM, COM 1, COM 2, COM 3, COM 4. That's how you would do it on your PC if, if right. that's what you're running. Yeah, you could do this by USB, USB 0, and it would work if you only have one USB device connected. But let's say, for example, you have two RT21 controllers connected. One is USB 0, and the other is USB 1. Depending on what order you turn them on, is depending on what order they get assigned to USB zero or USB one in the Raspberry Pi. So by doing it by the path to the, to the device, this information right here is a unique serial number that is um, embedded in a chip in the RT21 controller in the USB port. So it uses an F, uh, FTDI chipset in the RT21, which has a serial number. And that serial number, if it's a, if it's a real FTDI chipset, uh, or chip, it will always have a unique serial number. So by doing it this way, it doesn't matter what order you plug them in, it will always find the correct uh, device. And uh, so that's setting that up, we'll hit deploy. And just to restate, just to, if you're on a, a, a Windows, it'll be it'll use COM ports. Um, that's, so yeah. Yeah, and again, with the COM ports in Windows, with the enumeration of COM ports in Windows, um, it's highly recommended, uh, whether it's uh, an RT21 or uh, a USB to serial adapter or whatever it is that you're using, uh, try not to use prolific chipsets in Windows, uh, the prolific chipset uh, cables. Use one, it's an FTDI chipset cable. The reason being is when Windows enumerates the COM port, with the, with the FTDI chipset in the registry, it will say this serial number is this COM port and it marries those together in the registry and it always assigns it the same COM port number. That's why if you have a flex control knob in Windows, when you plug it in, if you notice it, it's always the same uh, COM port number. Any questions with this? Uh, the other thing in the, in the dashboard here is when we look at the dashboard, now you notice we have our map here and the map um, may not be centered you know, where you want it. So what I do is I use a program called Great Circle Mapper. And this is how I create the maps. And what I do is I put in a custom location. I could put in whatever latitude and longitude and it will center the map accordingly. And then after I do that, I go to plot. And what I do is these, these lines, uh, latitude and longitude lines, I turn lines off. And then what I do is I turn the prefixes on and it gives you the country prefixes. So, so again, in the setup, what I do is I set the, the latitude and the longitude, refresh the map. And then under plot, I turn the lines off and prefixes. Then under help, I save the map image. And then once I save the map image, um, what I do is I bring it open, if I can remember where I put them. Uh, under this. Anyway, um, well, anyway, wherever I save them, but the, the bottom line is uh, I, I save them into a folder. Actually, I think they're on my V drive, but the, uh, wherever, well, wherever I put them. But anyway, the bottom line is uh, I save it and then you have to resize it to 500 by 500 pixels. Um, you can make it smaller or larger, but when I've set it up in Node-RED with this flow, it, it, this is 500 by 500 pixels. 
in size. And in order to import a different map, this SVG graphics node, if you double click it and click open SVG editor, you'll see here's the map. And if I left click on the map, there's a, a open folder icon. I would click that and I would browse it to the folder, uh, to the file. Uh, it's a JPEG file. And then I would hit open and then I would hit apply and then it would import the new map. And then once you're done, you just close it. It'll prompt you to save and then you hit done. And that imports the new map. You would hit deploy and a new map would be deployed and you have it here. And with this, um, there are several ways that you can turn it. Uh, if I turn it from the controller, uh, what it's going to do here is it's just going to go ahead. And as you see, I just turned the knob a little bit and uh, it's going around. It's going to go around the world now, but um, I don't even know where it's going, but it's going. Um, and so what's going to happen? I was at, you know, I was at the, the rotor set up to go from zero to 360 plus 90. So it goes from zero to 450. So I moved it to, uh, you know, somewhere is in the zero to 90. Uh, I can't see it from here, but um, my rotor controller is actually out of view right now. But so I just moved the knob and, and it's going. There you go. It's, it's slowing down and, and coming up to where it's going to go. So if you move the knob just to green, which is the actual indicator of the position, the actual indication, that will only move. If you either click the knob uh, or click the map rather, or if you put in a call and call my call book program, I have this set up for N1MM Plus, uh, which, which I haven't finished yet. And then also for uh, N3FJP logger, if I were to put a call into N3FJP, it would uh, turn around and track also. If I turn, if you notice there's a heading up on the top, 34 degrees and the manual button. If I click on the manual and change it to tracking, uh, when I'm in N3FJP logger, if I were to enter a call sign, it would track based on the call sign. It will send the information from the log, logbook program to the node red, and it would then in turn send it to the controller to turn the antenna. Right now, again, our, our dashboard looks all messed up, which we have to fix once we're done here. So let me import the rest of these nodes real quick. Um, let the rest of the flows, rather. Uh, we've got the RT21 Power Genius, uh, uh, the Web Switch Pro, and uh, I'm using the DLI Web Switch Pro. It's an eight out it has 10 outlets on a power strip eight of them which are individually uh, switchable on and off and uh, hit deploy. And you would have to edit the curl node uh, to put in the, uh, the, uh, the address, uh, the IP address and password, which I'm gonna change when we're done here. So can't get access to it. Uh, but you'll need to edit it in two places in the curl node up on top and in the curl login over here uh, on the output of the buttons. So that's imported. Uh, we'll go to the next one. And uh, host monitors. And what this is set up is I ping the internet, uh, the radio, the PC, and the Raspberry Pi. And on the dashboard, I can get a quick status update of the health of the network. And the last one is speech, which is something that I've been working on and uh, I really haven't published. Uh, but what it does is I started uh, playing around with this as a proof of concept that you could use Node Red uh, to help the visually impaired hams uh, be able to set it up to interface to different radios and rotors, uh, antenna switches and whatnot. And it outputs uh, different commands to a reader node. So, you know, if I enable this right now, the flow is the flow itself is disabled. If I double click the tab up top, I can enable it and I could deploy it. And then uh, the speech is enabled. So if I take my radio and if I change the frequency on the radio, it would come out and it would read and it would read the frequency and the mode uh, that the radio is currently on. 
So it's it's just a little proof of concept that I was working on that I haven't uh, I haven't published that. And so now we have everything imported uh, that I normally had before, but as you see, everything on the dashboard right now looks kind of messed up. So uh, any questions on importing flows? And when you import a flow, uh, it's important that you look at the flow. And for example, uh, the Power Genius, uh, there's this white uh, node up top says README. If you double click it, set the TCP request node to the IP address of your Power Genius app. So uh, a lot of these flows have a README uh, that gives you instructions on how to configure it. Any questions so far? Dave, I have a question. This is Jerry. Yes, and uh, to delete a flow, can you show me? I want to make sure I understand how to delete a flow if I want to delete one. Yeah. Let's say the speech flow. Let's say you want to delete it. You double click it, hit delete. Now, what will happen is up under here, under if you go to configuration nodes, and what you could do is you can go to unused and you can see my speech node is no longer being used because I deleted that flow that was using that node. So you can actually double click it and then hit delete to delete the speech node. So if you want to clean things up, you can clean it up uh, in that respect. Um, then when we get into the dashboard, uh, you'll see I have all kinds of stuff all over the place. And um, the speech group right now, since I deleted it, the group is left there, but there's nothing in it. If I expand it, uh, and again, what I'm doing here is up in the top, this arrow down all the way to the right that's underneath the hamburger menu. I click that and I'm going to dashboard. And now we're into where we can arrange the dashboard. So if you notice the speech, when we deleted it, it left that group there, but there's nothing in it. So if I edit, I can then delete that group. So it's just a way of just keeping things clean. And so I actually have three tabs right now. And again, we haven't arranged the dashboard and make it look pretty. Matter of fact, uh, let's do this because I want to start the way it was. Dashboard. This is pretty much what you guys are going to see on the default when you when you first import a flow. It's pretty ugly looking. And um, in the upper left here, there's a little hamburger menu. And if you have more than one dashboard page, it will show you the different pages. I have my, my main page, and I have receiver, which shows me my four slice receive frequencies. Uh, and if you're using single client, just one, you know, like, you know Smart SDR connected to a radio, and that's the only connection. Uh, slice A, slice B, slice C, slice D. If you're running multi-client, uh, multiplex as they call it, um, you potentially could be the second client to connect. So your slice A may not be slice A here. So there's, again, my flows were designed for a single client. I know Alan's designing his for multi-client. And uh, so they're a little bit more involved, but um, when you connect in with a with a client, uh, the first client that gets the first slice that requests to you know create a slice is slice zero. Radio slice zero that would be slice A on the first client. If they only have one slice open, and then the second client connects with one slice, the next available slice in the radio slice is slice one. So slice A on client two would be slice one. It, it, you understand? So that it, you know, this, if this is just a, you know one person connected to the radio, this will show you your A, B, C, and D slices. And then they're testing. I just have my internet graph here to show average pings and stuff. So now our dashboard looks kind of ugly. We got to try and figure out and then fix it now. So right now it's ugly and we got to fix it. So the dashboard, again, clicking here, going to dashboard, you're in layout. So if we expand the first group uh, and expand the, fir the first subgroup, which is the first 
page, I should say, which is WO2X shock control. And if I want to name this, if I want to name this to WA9, WUD, I could do that. I could put in whatever I want, name it, and then I can just save it and then deploy it and it would change the name. So to edit the name, you click on edit. Uh, the groups, I have the different groups that are in there. I have my Flex Radio group, Power Genius, the Tuner Genius. I actually have two of them. Uh, Antenna Genius, I have two beam groups and two rotor and power switch groups, three of them actually, and two host pin groups, which we're going to fix. And uh, right now, uh, as I was playing around importing and, de and deleting stuff, uh, it, it left these remnants in there, and that's what's screwing up the dashboard. So under the flex radio, I have my model, the radio call sign, the client name, the client IP, the transmit VFO, the mode, the RF power, tune power, TX status, and then uh, this template, um, you look here, is uh, under the TX status here. And then I have the two icons here for the microphone for the record and playback. And uh, the template is a CSS template that I had in there that I'm not using. So it shows up in the dashboard, but it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up on the dash, but it shows up in the dashboard list. So you can kind of ignore that. And uh, the spacer, I added a spacer in there just uh, between the TX status where it says flex TX ready and the icon for the record and playback. There's a, there's a single line spacer in there. And well, we, so what, if I wanted to take this and if I wanted to add a line between client IP and TX VFO, if I wanted to add a blank line in that group, I would hit plus spacer. It creates a spacer. And then what I could do is I can drag it down between client IP and TX VFO. And now what I want to do is I want to size this to the width of the group. The group is six blocks wide and, and it'll be one block, one block high, or I could do three, four, five, six, all the way down as long as you want. But the width of the group is six. So you set it to six by one. And if I hit deploy, you'll see that it now adds that line into that space. So as you go to add stuff to your dashboard, if you want to try and add spaces and make things line up properly and pretty, you can go ahead and use that spacer and you know enter the spacer and move it around wherever you want to um, get it to where it looks nice. To delete it, you just hit edit and then delete. Then uh, Power Genius is fine. You see I have my idle standby, the forward power SWR, the temperature, harmonic load temperature, uh, AC voltage, uh, the DC voltage, I, you know, DC current, fan speed, and then band A and B. Um, so if you look here under band A and B, it tells me what band it's on. So right now on my client, uh, I am on antenna two, which is uh, 20 meters. So I have receive and transmit on antenna two, which is band B on the amplifier. If um, people who don't know what SO2R is, uh, the flex amplifier is an SO2R amp and the tuner is an SO2R tuner. So the antenna uh, one of the radio goes to the A side of the amp, out of the A side of the amp, into the A side of the tuner, out of the A side of the tuner, into the A side of my two by eight antenna switch. And then antenna two goes to the, through the B path. And that allows me to, in essence, have, um, if I bring it up and I want to add another pan adapter and I put the second one on 40 meters, let's say, then what will happen? You'll see that band A is on 40 and band B is on 20 meters. And I can be on both bands at the same time. So it's just SO2R setup. So the, the amplifier is laid out correctly. Now we get into the tuner genius where I have two different groups. So if you see, I expand the first one and there's nothing in it. But when I expand the second one, I have everything in here. So that first group uh, is an extra one that's in there. I want to delete that. And that just gets rid of that extra group. So if I hit deploy, it's already starting to look a little bit better now. So now I have my radio, power genius, the tuner genius, 
uh, my antenna genius group. And then you notice I have two beam groups and that's throwing things off. So continuing down, you see the first group, there's nothing in it. The second beam group I have uh, everything in here. So I'm gonna delete that first one. And this happens as you're loading flows, deleting flows, loading new flows, deleting flows. And every time you load and delete flows, it leaves remnants behind uh, that can cause issues. And the rotor and power switch, again, uh, if you notice here, uh, I've got, uh, it's kind of a little bit messed up the way I have it right now. So the first one, there's nothing in it. So I'm gonna delete that one. And this is where it gets a little tricky. And what I've done is I have, let me deploy in this first. If you look at my, my, if you look here, I have my rotor and power switch and I have two, two different groups that are named rotor and power switch. I have pre-programmed buttons for the rotor. So if I wanna to go to 50, I just click on the button and it's turning towards Europe. Um, and over here on the right, I have my power switch buttons where I could turn outlets on and off. I click on an outlet, turns it on, turns it off. What I normally do is on the left side, I would have the pre-programmed rotor beam heading buttons. And on the right side of the group, I would have the power switch buttons. And right now it's set up in two different groups. So to fix this, what I'm gonna do here is I have both of them expanded and the first one is zero is uh, due north. And then the second one down here in the next group is my first outlet. So I'm just gonna drag that up, left click it and drag it and put it there. And I'm just gonna stagger them. So it goes, it goes uh, you know, beam heading, outlet, beam heading, outlet. And that's what I'm gonna do here now. I'm just gonna do that. And this is just kind of just making it look a little, little prettier here, as you'll see. And then when you're done, uh, what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a group here with nothing in it. So you can delete that group. And while we're at it, we'll fix the host pings here, which I have one group that's blank. So I'm gonna delete the, the, the blank one. And so now everything looks good. I just have one of each group. Hit deploy. And so now you see I have and the way, reason it doesn't look as good is because I usually use 4K on my monitor and I change my resolution to uh, 1080p uh, so you guys can see the desktop better. So what I gotta do is I just gotta shrink this down. This would be my normal uh, dashboard. And you see now that everything falls into place. I have the radio, the power genius, the tuner genius, uh, the antenna genius, uh, the beam and the rotor and power control and the host pings. Now, one of the things that I don't like is I don't like this light color on the dashboard. Uh, under theme, uh, by the way, when you're doing layout, as you're laying these things out, if you notice I have things lined up nice, uh, you can go in under layout and under the main group here, if you go to layout, it will give you a graphical representation of the layout that you can move things around. So you can actually take the recording and playback and move them up. I don't know why there's template nodes in here. Um, you have to remove that and move that up because I have things that are just screwed up right now. So don't mind me, but um, I've been kind of editing. Yeah. This is Brett, the bx 7 y the other day, I was going in there and uh, going and changing the layout a little bit. And I don't know if I was going too quickly or what, but uh, when I'd save it and then uh, look at my desktop, man, it, it threw in spaces all over the place and rearranged the, the buttons and stuff. Do you have any idea why that would be doing that? To, uh, um, I don't. Um... I'm not sure why it would do that. So um, really don't know, but yeah, I, I don't know. But again, like here, I, for example, uh, I'm just gonna go back 
it done out of here. I'm going to go back into here. I'm not sure where this template node came from, but I'm going to delete it. Let's see. Uh, that's my CSS template. So that shouldn't be showing up. So if I hit deploy, yeah, so it doesn't show up. So if you notice the height at the bottom right here, the bottom of the node, uh, the flex radio, the power genius, and the tuner genius are all the same height. Now, if you notice the next one where it says antenna genius, I have that extra space between the fans and the mic uh, level meter. And so we can go in there if we want to try to pretty that up. Again, we have two ways of doing that. If you're in the layout, you see that space there. I can just drag the level and the LED up, and that will shrink that. And if I hit done and deploy, now that's the same level. The, the, the beam is the same level uh, over here and the rotor and power switch is all lined up. And then the last group, I just have one, two, three lines in the bottom that are just not filled in. Uh, there's nothing in there. So if I wanted to uh, add a spacer in there, I could do that. So under that last group, host and pings, on the bottom here, I would add a spacer. So over here in our host and pings, I would hit plus spacer. And I said it was three lines. So I want to hit edit. I'm going to make that the width by three, six by three. And now you see that if you see here with the line at the bottom, it's hard to tell, but the line is there. Now, again, one of the things with the, uh, when you go in the site, you can, you know, the title node red dashboard, um, that really doesn't show up here. Uh, options show in the title bar. Click to show side menu. Um, you know, you can change these here. The node red theme everywhere. Uh, what I do is right now it's set for light theme. If I change mine to uh, the theme, you have light, you have dark. I'll show you what dark looks like. There's your dark theme. So it looks a little nicer right off the bat. But I like it instead of a gray, I like a black. And instead of the buttons being more square, I like the buttons to be rounded using a little CSS. So what I do is I do custom. And um, I haven't set up all my colors. Uh, actually, I did. So if I hit custom and hit deploy, I thought I hit custom. But anyway, uh, custom theme. And if you check on any of these colors here, and you can change that down to black, where it says group background, and widget background, and sidebar background. I just put that little dot all the way in the bottom left corner, which is black. And um, so I'm going to deploy. And you see it looks a lot nicer now. And uh, so I have a tracking and manual button up here, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but that's pretty much loading the nodes, loading the flows, and then doing some customizing in a dashboard. I, I know it went through pretty quick. And again, we are recording this, and I want to go ahead and make sure that we have this available um, up on YouTube so people can go through it a little bit slower. Uh, any questions so far? And under the host monitor, um, you would need to set under internet, for example, I'm pinging www.google.com. You notice uh, these are what they call ping nodes. And then I'm pinging my radio, the IP address of my radio. Uh, my PC, which right now my PC is blocking it with the firewall. And the Raspberry Pi itself. So when I go into dashboard, um, PC is showing false because the firewall is blocking the ping request, uh, ICMP. But it's pinging uh, the internet at 10.9 milliseconds, uh, the radio at you know 0.17 milliseconds, and the Pi at 0.08 milliseconds. Okay, Mike wants to know how to get the round buttons. Okay, right the corners. Yeah, the round buttons, um, I probably need to, uh, 
redo my CSS. I deleted a bunch of stuff out of here. One of the things I uh, we did not import uh, was my CSS node. And uh, without the CSS, it won't know what to do. Um, I probably need to restart the pie for it to take effect now or restart node red. So. Node red stop. And then you'll see it says, welcome to node red dashboard. Please add some nodes. Because yeah, there's nothing running right now. Restart node red. And now when you restart it, you'll see you get a bunch of information coming in from the radio that shows up uh, when you restart it. And they still didn't show up as round buttons. And I got to figure out why. What did I do wrong? I'll fix it. But uh, the flows, um, as I said, I was deleting a bunch of stuff on here and getting ready for the, for the, um, for the call tonight. But if I go into here and go to date modified, um, what I could do here is, for example, this is what my dash normally looks like. And you can see I have the rounded edge buttons and stuff. So I got to go ahead and uh, redo my CSS. It's the CSS that defines the buttons. Uh, you do a radius, you can define the radius turn on the buttons and you could define the colors. And uh, to go into a little bit more detail, uh, for example, under the tuner genius, um, the tune function, I'm using what they call a UI template. And in the UI template, I'll bring this open so you guys can see it. And it's missing all of the, uh, yeah, I noticed it's missing all my CSS stuff when I imported this. So uh, that's why uh, it, it's actually, actually it, it's, it's missing some of the stuff that was in here. And, um, but you can go in here under MD button class, vibrate, filled, touched, small font, rounded. And then in the CSS is where you would actually identify and, um, and you can actually set it up, you know, for a rounded small font. Um, and you would define the border uh, radius and everything on a rounded button in a small font of 12 pixels or a big font of 18 pixels. And so if you're good with uh, CSS, uh, you can really make this thing look pretty. Uh, if you're good at, uh, at website coding, um, you can use an alternate to the dashboard uh, where you can use HTML and create your dashboard in HTML. And what I'll do is I'll just restart the pie for now and we'll see what happens. Um, hey, Dave, is that how you got the ready and green in the text box? Yeah. On the left side of your dashboard? Yeah, I, yeah, I just hit node red stop. Let me reboot it and I'll show that to you. Um, but that was done through CSS, not through the nodes, correct? It's through the nodes. Um, so I'll show you that as soon as it reboots. It's, it's CSS, but through the nodes also. So in the nodes, I'm setting the, uh, the color. Uh, and there's a function uh, like the idle standby you see that's in front of you. Right now, it's not the pie is rebooting, so I can't click on anything. But this function node before it is what sets up the, uh, the, the label. And there you go, just connected. So this function node here sets up the label and the color and the state of it, uh, and it sets this up, and I use it as a, I do it as a toggle button. So um, depending on the state, depending on the label and the color, uh, for example, in the Power Genius, and that didn't fix my CSS, but you notice it changes colors. Standby is gray, and it says standby. Power up is blue, and then idle is green. And then if I were to transmit. Um, transmit B. It tells me what, what, uh, which side of the amplifier is transmitting, A or B. And that's, that's kind of what, it'll, what, what I get out of it. Wow. And then okay. the tuner genius, again, standby and operate uh, the radio one, radio two. 
uh, I can force the tuner to be active on either side for receive. Uh, when I transmit, I'm on radio two on transmit. So if I transmit on radio two, right now the tuner is on radio one, you'll see the tuner will flip the radio two. And um, the antenna switch over here, uh, if you notice radio two is on 20 meters, I'm on my five band Yagi. And on 40, the only antenna I have active is the G5RV. But if I were to kill the 40 meter uh, slice, I gotta move this out of the way. There we go. All right, I just disabled the 40 meter slice. So now I can toggle between G5RV and the five band Yagi. And the tuner, the tuner genius will actually remember the tuner settings for two different, you know, for up to four different antennas. So as I change antennas, uh, if you watch the CDL and, and the C, C1L and the C2 under the tuner genius window, uh, and when I switch antennas, you'll see that the, the tuning will change. So I'm on the G5RV now, and when I go to the Aggie, uh, you'll see that they change. So, and if I wanted to tune, I can click the tune button and uh, it tunes. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so going actually pretty quick, if you guys want to go a little bit more, I'll dig into a couple of these flows and sh show you behind the scenes of how I've done a couple of things. Um, for example, in the, in the uh, Power Genius flow, uh, I've got a TCP uh, request node here. And what I'm sending in is I'm doing a timestamp and that timestamp is set up that, you know, interval of every uh, point, every 15 seconds, what is that point 15? I can't read it. Every point 15 seconds, every 150 milliseconds, it's going to go ahead and it's going to send this command uh, into the amplifier. Uh, for the amplifier uh, API, it's uh, C, you know, capital C, and then a, um, a sequence number, and then pipe, uh, the pipe command, uh, which is a uh, shift backslash, and then status shift backslash N for uh, line feed. And then, you know, you put that in quotes and it sends that. So it's doing the status request to the amplifier every 150 milliseconds. Remember we were talking about the debug node. I'm gonna go ahead and wire this. What I did is I dragged the debug node in. I'm just gonna take the mouse and I'm gonna wire it directly to the output of that status. I'm gonna to go to my debug screen. I'm gonna get it set at the current flow. And I'm gonna hit deploy. I'm gonna turn this debug off and uh, I'm gonna hit deploy. And so now it's sending C1 status into the amplifier. That's what's gets, getting sent in right now. So I turn that off, this little window to the right of it toggles it between on and off. If I dragged another one in and I come out of the amplifier and there's a little garbage can up here that I can click to clear the debug window, I'll hit deploy and you'll see what comes out is uh, hex and raw data. The raw data that comes out is hex. And if I were to turn around and change that from raw to string, you'll see it tells me a bunch of information. So the first thing I do is I do a hex to string node, which comes in, it says the message payload, which is the data that comes out of the node. Yeah, I'm taking it saying message payload dot to string and it's UTF-8 formatted string. So comes out of there. And if I remove this over and come out of the hex to string node and hit deploy and turn this back on, you'll see now it's readable uh, data. State is idle, band A, band A is zero, band B, you know, and uh, you can't read it, but uh, that's in the way, but you, you can see all the data that comes in. And now what I'm doing is I'm parsing this. Now to forward power, to peak forward power, uh, and then the, uh, the SWR is all in DBM. So this shows up in DBM. And so I come over here, into a switch node, which uh, it's um, out of the switch node here, I'm looking for message payload matches state equals. 
So when it comes up, the first thing out of this, it says state equals. So I'm looking for packets that contain state equals. And that has the information that I want to show up on my dashboard. Uh, I'm then splitting it based on uh, the equal sign. So if you notice state equals idle, band A equals zero, band B equals, uh, it's probably on 20 still. Uh, and then same thing, uh, all of these like forward equals 30.0, peak forward equals 30.0. So each of these values is the name and then equals and then the value. So I'm splitting it on the equal sign. And so what that will look like on the output It's always fun doing this when you when you're playing around with this, and that you guys can do this with the message with the debug node just to go through the different flows and try to learn how these things are working. And if you notice, uh, if I stop it now, you'll see I have every one of these things. It's the prior name ID equals and then zero, so it's ID, but it, it split it on the equal. So the first the, the top line is ID, which is the current, is zero. Peak ID is zero forward is 30.0, peak forward is 30.0. And again, that's in DBM. Um, so then I come into this switch node and this is where I do uh, message parts index because when it, when it splits it, it creates all these message parts. So if we were look at, if I change this message payload, which is still connected to the split node and I go into complete message object, and I hit deploy. I'll just turn it on real quick, turn it off. And for example, if I extend and it disappears real quick. Anyway, uh, if you look at one of these, you'll see that it's parts and it has an index number. So each one of these comes out has a separate index number. So the first part of it, when it splits it, where it says state, that would be part zero equals, uh, and then whatever the state is idle, idle would be part one. And so what I do now in the switch node is I create all these index between zero, uh, you know, zero to zero, one to one, two to two. So each index comes out a separate output. So the first one, which would have the word state, I turn it around, change it back to message payloads easier. Um, like the first output, which I'm not using, if I were to connect this, you would see that I would get the word right here, R1 pipe zero, which is uh, R1 is it's, re it's returning, it's what's returning for the command you sent in, which is the C1, which is the command for the status update. And one is the sequence number pipe and zero means it was successful. So it was, it's in, that's in the flex API, uh, zero is a successful command pipe, and then it starts returning the data state. So anything before that first equal sign is in that first part, which is of really no use to me. I don't care about the word state. Uh, but I am interested in the second part, which the second output is going to be whether it's idle, whether it's uh, uh, right here. And if you notice, it says idle space band A. So we're only concerned with the idle at this point. So now we know that that second part is the state, the state is idle. So I come in and I say, okay, I come into a string and what I'm doing is I'm chomping right. And what that's doing is it's saying, give me everything to the right of, I mean, it's, it's deleting everything from band A to the right. So chomp right means anything from this part of it would be deleted. So it's just returning idle and then space. And then um, I'm doing two things. I'm using a change node to set the flow dot state to whatever the output is, in this case, idle. Then up top, it comes up and comes up to this function node. And then it says, uh, if state equals, and then now here it is, if state equals idle, message background, it sets the message background color to uh, green, uh, or, and then it says, if state equals standby, it sends message background color. And if you were to look up the CSS color, that's gray. And it, else if, you know, so it goes through this if else statement, 
and it says if state equals transmit A, it sets it to red. If it's state equals transmit B, it sets it to red. And if state equals power up, it sets it to blue. And again, if you uh, look up CSS colors, you'll uh, see that. So anyway, uh, just for example, just on a quick one, I just did a CSS colors and you could see there's different colors and there's, there's a whole myriad of different colors that you can choose and here's the hex number for the corresponding colors. So that's how I'm setting the color and I'm setting the label, uh, you know, so it has the color and then under here, idle standby, uh, I'm using the, what they call the mustache bracket. Uh, is that correct statement, Steve? Mustache bracket? Yeah. <laughs> so it's double mustache bracket and it's message dot label. And so I'm setting it uh, based on that uh, is how I'm setting the label. And um, so in the CSS, it's setting to uh, double mustache message dot background and for the background color. And um, you know, the, the message label is the label itself. So, and again, that's coming out of the function node here. So, yeah, I'm doing um, a message label equals the message payload. So, what's coming out of the switch node is the state. And I'm setting that to message.label. And in here, this is where you set it, this double uh, thing here. And you can make this a double height button. If you notice in my dashboard with the rotor control buttons, it says zero north. So you can have, you know, the label and then you could say amp or something underneath it if you wanted to. Um, and that would be the second line of the uh, UI template, uh, which I'm using as a button. And then over here, when I click it, it's saying, okay, uh, when I click it, it just sends a payload of hello world. If anybody does programming, you know what hello world is, but so when I click it, it executes this here. So it says uh, flow get state. So it's getting the current state of the amplifier. And if it's in, if it's in standby, it's, it, it sets the label to operate, sets the background color to green, and it sets the payload uh, and sends a command to the amp to turn it on and to operate. If it's idle, it then sets it to standby, sets the color to gray, and then sets the uh, tells the operate equals zero and turns it to standby. So what this UI template does is it's just setting the background co color on you know depending on what message dot background is, and it's setting the label to whatever message dot label is. And every time I click it, it just sends a payload to the this function node here, and that function node is then saying okay what is my current state? Gets the current state and then just toggles it to the opposite state. So pretty, pretty simple. Um, if I were to clear this and turn this debug on, uh, and I came back in here and just went into here and toggled it between auto and standby, you'll see that I sent that hello world, that's this wire here. And this one here, it sent out C6 pipe operate equals zero and put it in the standby. And that comes out and goes into the uh, TCP request going to the amplifier. But in the function node, it also sets uh, these parameters here uh, to change colors. Any questions? No, moving along. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to cover tonight. Is there anything, uh, again, um, with the serial nodes, uh, that seems to be something that comes up quite a bit uh, for like a rotor that's connected directly to the Raspberry Pi uh, or any other device, a USB to serial cable. If you have a Kenwood radio and you use a USB to serial FTDI cable and you want to be able to get the serial information in and out of the Kenwood radio into, into node red, uh, again, you need to know that um, ID of the USB cable. Uh, in VNC viewer, 
again, if you go into, uh, you bring up the file explorer and VNC viewer in the Pi, this is the desktop of my Raspberry Pi here. So um, you bring up the, uh, the file explorer, go to dev and then serial. And you can see you have by ID and by path. And you go to by ID, you highlight the device and I would do these one at a time, right click it, copy path, and you're done with the VNC viewer, then you would come back into here. And if you didn't have anything in here, um, let's do this. I just blew away my serial nodes. All right, so now I have my serial nodes, I just imported a flow and it says missing serial config. Uh, so there's nothing configured. So what I want to do is double click it. It's telling me to add a new serial port. If you notice there's nothing there, I hit the pencil. I left click in the box. I right click, I hit paste. And I set my board rate accordingly for the rotor. And this default response time, 500. I hit add, done. Then in the other one down here, I double click it. And now when I click on it, you see that when I just defined is there, I select that and hit done and deploy. And now my rotor's back again. But that's what you would do to set the uh, setup uh, for your specific uh, device that you're plugging in uh, into one of the USB ports in the uh, Raspberry Pi. That's probably the biggest gotcha that a lot of people run into is uh, when they import a flow that uses a USB to serial adapter uh, such as a green heron everywhere rotor controller or USB to serial cable uh, that they have difficulty in getting it to work. And uh, so you need to, again, use the VNC viewer, go in, uh, go into um, it's uh, DEV, you know, DEV serial by ID and uh, just right click it, copy path. And then you would go back in and edit the serial. And if you have something that's in there that's not your device, you can just uh, click the pencil, delete it. And then it's going to tell you, once you delete it, it says add a new one. Click the pencil, and then you can set it up from scratch. You paste in that path that you copied. Make sure your board rate matches. And also, again, set up for your proper... Uh, uh, response timeout. Uh, the other thing too is depending on the uh, on the rotor, and, and this is important. Um, depending on the rotor and depending on the protocol, uh, the output uh, protocol, uh, the uh, the split character. Uh, now I'm using uh, DCU one protocol. So in DCU one protocol. I can spell, I'd be dangerous. Uh, so anyway, just for example, on, on just any of them, like for example, the idiom press interface, uh, they end in a semicolon. All of these commands, uh, the AP, uh, AP1 XXX, uh, AP1 followed by three digits sets the, uh, the um, and then carriage return would set it and execute. But uh, you know, the all the commands coming back return the, uh, would have, AP1, uh, you know, and uh, it, would, it would come back and it would give you a carry, uh, you know, for example, let's just say uh, your rotor, you don't know uh, what it is, but you would have to look it up. And uh, if you're returning a uh, line feed or a carriage return after every command coming in. So um, again, your debug node is your friend here. And what I'm gonna do is hit deploy. And you can see right now, I'm not getting anything out of my rotor uh, with it set to line feed. If I go back into pencil, what I'm talking about right here is split input on character. And right now it's set for line feed. If I change this to the semicolon, which is what the DCU1 protocol uses, it should start giving me my rotor bearing now, 051 semicolon. So, 
Uh, I know some of the guys with the ERC rotor controllers were having difficulty in making this work with the GS232B uh, protocol. So you need to look at the protocol and what does it use uh, as a terminator when it sends it from the rotor out. In this case, in the RT21 with DCU1, uh, it sends the beam heading uh, followed by a semicolon. So in the serial in node, uh, which if you notice the, the output is on the right, so this is an in node, uh, you need to go into pencil and under the input, make sure that's the split input on semicolon. Everybody understand that? And now, yeah, good. No, I, uh, this is Jerry. I've got a question, and, and David may be better to address it later, but uh, of course I use the, the PST rotor software and that's connected on a Windows PC. Um, and then I use a Pi 4 with Node Red that's plugged in the network right. also. Right, so right. how would I make those two communicate together? Yeah, uh, I have a flow that's on the site uh, it says, for example, RT21, uh, where is it? I'll tell you where it is. Hold on. I'll tell you where it is. Hold on. I go into files. By type. I go into rotor. I should have... Uh, Right here, the PST Rotator WO2X. If you load that one, uh, that one will work. Uh, and what you need to do is in PST Rotator, which I do have installed, although I'm not using it. Uh, in PST Rotator, what you would do, I just closed it, I mean, oh no, I didn't, it's there. All right, what you need to do is you gotta go under setup, you gotta enable UDP control, Right. And then under communications, UDP control setup, you put in the IP address of the Pi. Or in your case, if you're, it, you know, are you using a Pi for Node Red? Yes, I am. I'm using a okay. Pi for, for Node Red. Okay. So this would be the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. And then you hit save settings. And then in that flow, um, what I'll do here is I'll just do this. I'm cheating. So, I see that. Okay, as long as you admit it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm che yeah, I'm cheating. So anyway, so I just imported that flow that, that I referred to on the site. And what you would have to do, the only thing you need to do in this flow is, is, uh, is this UDP out node is you just need, need to put in your PC IP address that's running node uh, that's running PST rotator. Okay. All right, and then that then it should work. Okay, I'll and try. So PS, yeah, so PST rotator would be set up for whatever controller you're using, uh, whatever, and then uh, and then that'll allow uh, Node Red to talk to PST rotator. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think we covered quite a bit in, the, in an hour and a half. So I don't want to make this uh, a very long call because uh, people start falling asleep and drifting off. But um, I think this is enough that, again, I'm going to post this up on YouTube probably tomorrow and I'll send uh, I'll notify the group. And what I, what I want to do at that point, you know, see there's a bunch in the chat. I haven't even read any of the chat here. So <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, going through, uh, just going through this anyway. Um, again, what I want to do is uh, uh, the Angular, yeah, uh, for the buttons. And uh, yeah, the Angular buttons are pretty cool, uh, what Stephen was referring to there. Uh, for example, uh, when you look at here with the microphone and the playback buttons, these are angular buttons. And, um, you know, if you go into uh, just, uh, there are thousands of buttons available. Uh, and there's just all kinds of, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of links, but uh, there, there's 
you know, all kinds of stuff uh, that you can get. Um, but the angular buttons uh, are, are pretty cool. There's, there's a list of them and um, angular material and um, you could go in and there's all kinds of examples and uh, they're, I think they're up to uh, angular six now, Stephen, is that correct? Yes, angular six. And uh, you know there, there's all kinds of different buttons. So you can go in there and probably find a button uh, that you could use and, and you know customize uh, again uh, you know when you set it up. And what I do in uh, my DLI web switch, uh, these buttons here are angular buttons. So I'm using uh, you know FA power off, for example, uh, which is a font awesome button. So if you do font awesome, and uh, you'll see uh, icons font awesome, and there's there's all kinds of icons, and you you pick the category you want computers, uh, you know you got memory, you got keyboard, uh, mouse. Uh, here's the power off button that I'm using for for my flow. Um, as speaker icons if you want to have a speaker and you can have uh, for the speaker you can have a speaker that's filled in and a speaker that's kind of like a shadow so for a, a speaker on speaker off button uh, you could toggle between them or toggle the color of them so what i'm doing is uh, i am using the fa power off button and when it's when it's on i have it light green and when it's off i have it red and so that's what I use for my power buttons uh, right over here. It just click on it, turns green, and they're animated, so it looks like it kind of flips around. Well, um, could you go back over what uh, node you're using for those buttons? Is yeah, it a standard uh, button. It, yeah, it's a standard button node. So, like for example, if I just were to create another flow here and scroll down. Um, you know, here's your out. Here's your dashboard nodes right here. It says dashboard here right. the nodes. So I just drag in a button, and if I edit that button uh, right here, um, you could sit there and uh, under the icon, uh, you could sit there and do it. So if you look at um, where I have it under the web switch, right here under icon, I have it custom. I have to remember where I put it. But so you can under icon here, uh, you can set it up and you could put custom in and it would just allow you to edit that. And it's actually not a button, it's a switch, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a switch. So under icon, you go to custom and now you can change it. You can change your color, you can animate it, you can change, you know, use one of those uh, Angular or Font Awesome uh, icons. And, oh, thank uh, you very much. I, I was using button and I could not find those settings. <laughs> yeah, it's a switch. Sorry about that. So yeah, so that's where it is. And the switch allows you to toggle on and off. Uh, so that's what I'm using under here. And then what I did is, and I don't know why my, my round buttons are not showing up, but uh, luckily I uh, backed everything up. But uh, the tune, the radio one, the radio two and everything, um, I'll, I'll fix this tomorrow, but they normally would have that rounded look to them uh, when I when I set them up. So my dashboard normally would look like this. I run power, uh, smart SDR on the bottom and I run the dashboard up on top of it. All right. Would you mind publishing your DL web switch? Because I'm about to buy, it, buy one. I'd it, love it, to use your code. It's, uh, it's already on the site. It's under files, okay. and if you go flow by type, and you go into relays, relays, okay. uh, DLI Web Switch Pro. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dave. Would you uh, would you mind to touch on backing this up? You know, once you do your work, it's easiest way to back it up. Sure. Um, when you're done, you can if you wanted to export um, a specific flow, say my Flex Radio flow. Just a single flow under the on the right that hamburger menu that you go to for the palette manager. Uh, you can go to export, and now you have 
uh, either selected nodes where you can go in and say, okay, hey, I want to export just this part of it. And you could just drag a box around those nodes and export. And now, or not import, get out of here. Uh, you could go to export, you could do selected nodes, you could do the parent flow, you could do all flows. So if you're going to do individuals, parent flow, I do it as a JSON. I do, I always like formatted, just makes it nice and neat. And I hit download and it downloads it as a flows.json. Then I could take that show and folder. I could rename it to uh, flex radio. Uh, uh, dot JSON, and you know, I could move it. I have a, uh, a RAID drive set up where I have all my stuff backed up to, but uh, so I back them up as JSON files individually. And then when you're all done, if you want to have a global backup, let's say you did this and you built it on a PC and you want to migrate to a Raspberry Pi, uh, what you could do is you could go to export. Uh, you can go all flows, JSON, formatted, and then download. And now you can save this. And this is all of those flows in one JSON file. So you would build up the Raspberry Pi, load in the necessary prerequisite nodes, import this one file, and you'd have all your tabs, all your flows. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you could always take the SD card in the uh, Pi and just make a copy of it also. Uh, so you can back up the complete SD card in the Raspberry Pi once you get everything where, hey, today it's running great. I'm going to make a backup. All right. Any other questions? Well, I thank everybody for attending. And uh, again, I'm going to uh, go ahead and... Uh, stop sharing my desktop and uh, we'll call it a night here. I'll stop the recording and um, I'll get this up on the, uh, again, I'll get this up on the uh, group. So uh, uh, yeah, projects. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, one of the things that Node Red uh, now supports is what they call projects. And I don't have it. This is a brand new pie that I built but you can enable uh, projects in Node Red, and so you can have uh, your main operating day-to-day -day, uh, Node Red uh, as one project, and you create a new project if you wanted to experiment and stuff without um, having the possibility of doing any anything wrong or screwing things up in your in your working Node Red environment. So if you're if you're building a, if you want to fiddle around and, and tweak things and, and learn how things work, uh, you can enable projects uh, on NodeRed.org. Uh, there's information, um, you know, some sites that are, are really good information is, you know, first of all, is NodeRed.org, uh, a lot of good information, and uh, they're up to 2.06, so I got to upgrade mine. And uh, speaking of upgrades, just real quick, um, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, you'll see that I'm at Node Red version 2.05. So, uh, in the easiest way to upgrade Node Red, the easiest way, um, I'm going to log on as Pi and then do Node Red uh, stop. If I could type my password, you should share your screen if you're trying to show people that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I will. Uh, share screen. There you go. All right. Um, so I did a node red stop. And again, on nodered.org, um, in order to, uh, it, it tells you here, getting started, Raspberry Pi. This is the command you would run to install. This is in the, uh, in the wiki when you install the node red, when you install the operating system on the Pi and then installing node red, uh, this is the command that you run. So I'm just going to copy that. If I want to upgrade my Node Red, um, I did a Node Red stop. So and then from the Raspberry Pi, this is from uh, using Putty uh, to SSH in, and I'm just going to run that script. And then this is going to go ahead and I hit yes, yes, 
And what it's going to do now is it's going to do, uh, it's going to stop node red if it was running. And then it's going to go ahead and it's going to sit there and look at my, my, uh, you know, the node.js and the NPM, make sure that they're at the right versions. And then it's going to upgrade the node red core to 2.06, which is the latest. So install upgrading node red, uh, use that bash command that's on the node red.org site. Uh, it's probably the easiest uh, method to do an upgrade of Node Red, and then uh, when we get it, that, as soon as this is uh, upgraded, uh, to upgrade the individual nodes, uh, which we can't see right now. Should have did that first. Um, you can turn around, and uh, when you go into the uh, Palette Manager and you look at your installed nodes, it will tell you the version of each node. And if there is a update available for the node, it will prompt you with a new version and there'll be an update button. You can click update and then uh, it will update that node. And if required, will prompt you to restart node red. So this is just going from 2.05 to 2.06. I didn't even look at the release notes to see what uh, is required. And so now I'm done. I could do a node red start. Uh, yeah. My fingers are faster than my brain, or my brain's faster, less slower than my fingers. Um, no type problem. Yeah. So anyway, I'll close that. So now if I come back into here and I go into the manage palette, if you notice here under the nodes that are installed, these are to install new nodes. When you click nodes, uh, you'll see the version number and then you scroll down and everything is up to date in mine. Uh, nothing is showing that it requires updating. If it did, it would show you the, the new version number and there would be an update button. You click update. And then you would hit, you know, uh, close, and then you would be prompting you to go ahead and do an update at that point. And, and then, I mean, it will prompt you to uh, restart Node Red if you needed to. Any questions? All right. Uh, if anybody has anything that comes up that you think about anything after the fact, uh, just you know, put it out to the uh, to the group, and uh, I'm sure somebody will get back to you and help you out. Thanks a lot, David. All right, thanks for uh, thanks for attending. Hopefully, this was useful to you guys. And uh, uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll try to get another uh, another meeting in the future where we can uh, go over some of the more advanced uh, topics, um, possibly some parsing and, and things like that. A little bit more in the uh, customization of the dashboard and you know different things like that. So if you guys have any ideas for uh, more advanced topics, uh, just you know, put them out. And we'll get a list together and uh, get it going. Hey, Dave, I have a yeah. question for you that's somewhat sure. related. Mm -hmm. Is the is the um, tuner genius power genius is the protocol the same for those or it's, very similar? It is. Uh, it is similar. Um, for example, on the tuner on the power genius, as you see, uh, pretty much the only thing I'm really sending is just the status command. Uh, yeah. C one status. And then to for the uh, function command uh, to toggle between operate and standby, it's uh, again you know C six uh, pipe operate equals one operate equals zero, yep. um, and then the output again is just coming out. And what I did for SWR for example is I'm converting doing the math to convert from DBM into SWR. Do they, do they have that documented anywhere or anything close to it? I, I don't see it anywhere in their wiki. The Power Genius and the Tuner Genius uh, is not documented, but the Antenna yeah. Genius is. No, oh, I must not have seen that. If you happen to do a Wireshark capture of some of the stuff going yes, back and forth will, between, will the commands. Yes, you between will. it and the rate, send it to me because I suspect if it's pretty close, the parser that I have for the other node might work. Mm -hmm. And that might save you a bit of, of labor in your nodes too. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I'd have to send it to you. What you know, and again, I could send you the, the raw data that comes out. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Do you want it as a, a hex or string that comes out, or does it matter? Eh, probably. Eh, the, the the string would be easy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can capture the string that comes out. Send it to you. Are you and familiar? Then, are you familiar with Wireshark for yeah, capturing yeah, network traffic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just capture all the network traffic, I mean, well, there might be other stuff in there that you care about, but, yeah, but I, like, I, I can I can pull apart the TCP dump file. Yeah. For example, in the amplifier, the only thing I'm really doing, and then the oh, the other thing I have is because um, then I can see the UDP data that they send back and forth as well. Because I'm curious how the meters get reported to the radio. Yeah. I think yeah, I've got so, a pretty good handle on it, but. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, what this is doing is I have three options. It's, you know, and I'm sending C7, C8, C9, doesn't matter, but it's set up space fan mode, space standard, set up space fan mode, space contest, set up space fan mode, space broadcast. And that actually the, yeah. command, the commands are, you know, pretty much here set up. Uh, and then it reads too. So I have, yeah. uh, we're set up at space read and it'll read the configuration of the amplifier. Yeah, because if I can test some of that against the parser and the stuff I have now, right. I can I can pull out and make a, like I have a, a node that will just decode a, a Vita 49 packet. Right. I could pull back out that node that will just decode the things. Yeah. Like, or, or you might be able to just plug the, you know, add another config node and point it at the tuner genius right. or the Like for power example, genius. For, for, the, yeah. for the tuner genius to select uh, you know the uh, channel A on the tuner. Yeah, I'm sending the command C6 activate space channel equals one uh, line feed. I'd I'd be curious if you created a new config node and gave it the IP address of the tuner genius if it would if it would friggin work. Yeah, I, uh, I yeah that'd I'll, be interesting. I'll Sorry, try that. Yeah, I've totally try that. sidetracked your whole conversation here. Yeah. My bad. And then, like for example, replicating the tune button on the front of the tuner. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just sending, uh, you know, you know, C is, you know, sequence number, pipe, and then auto tune, and then line feed. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, you know, I suspect it's pretty close if it if it's not spot on already. Right. And again, what comes back um, is pretty much, you know, again, uh, as I showed before, it's just a, a bunch of hex and yeah. converted to a string. And then once it goes uh, to, you know, goes to string and then it goes and I parse the substring uh, and it says if message stat equals uh, S3 status, yeah. then I return the payload. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, if you can send me either some, some um, just yeah. the, the raw strings going back and forth or a, a Wireshark capture and I can, I can start from there. Okay. I'll send you for the amp and the tuner. Yeah. That'd yeah, be interesting to take and a look anyway, see if, see yeah, if I can make some progress. Yeah, the Antenna Genius is published. Uh, if I remember where it was. Uh, yeah, I looked on their site, but I didn't see it. No, it's it's buried. I have to find it, and and uh, I'll uh, I'll put it up there. But the Antenna Genius is documented, but the amp and the tuner are not. Yeah, I looked in their community too, and I didn't find it in there either. But yeah, because I... this well, when when we did this, this is. When you look at the set, uh, when you look at this, when we did this, is pretty cool. And how we did this, where it pulls the names, uh, the the antenna genius flow, it pulls the names from the antenna genius configuration, and then it pulls the status, the colors, and sets the colors. To, it pulls that right from the antenna genius. Oh, so neat. Node Red is not setting that. That's all set. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. information. I admit I was having fun making up my own fake meters and sending them to the radio. That was kind of interesting, but. <laughs> what is that? You doing 10,000 watts? What? <laughs> no, no, no. I was, yeah, it made it look like it, but it wasn't. <laughs> so anyway, so, all right, gentlemen, again, it's been a long call. So I'll, I'll say seven, three and, uh, and to stop the recording. And seven, three.